Hey everyone, we're going to start by just finishing up the last few paintings we had for the early Italian Renaissance and then we'll go into talking about the high Italian Renaissance. So the group last week talked a bit about this work, The Birth of Venus, and they did a good job of talking about how Venus had dual meanings and how that's shown here in the work and what that would have meant to contemporary viewers. Um, I'm going to just give you a few more details and talk to you a little bit about the style and I might repeat a little bit of what they said last week just because that was last week and I can't remember every single detail that they talked about now. So hopefully this isn't too repetitive, but um, we know that this was likely done for the Medici family. And most agree that it was likely done to celebrate a wedding because it's on canvas, which is an unusual medium. Uh, canvas is usually something that was used for temporary kind of ephemeral works of art, like something you'd use in a parade or for some sort of celebration. Um, it wasn't normally used for works of art that were meant to be permanent. But nonetheless, this is on canvas. And what we have then is Venus being born out of the foam of the sea. We have Chloris and Zephyrus, uh, coming in on the left, and Pomona, uh, the goddess of spring, coming in on the right. So one thing we just need to kind of talk a little bit about, they've already talked about the meanings behind Venus, but I would like to just remind everyone that these mythological figures and mythological stories became more acceptable because, remember, for Neoplatonism, they felt like using those mythological kinds of stories wasn't necessarily a sign that you believed in their factuality, but it was a, a way to kind of understand the world allegorically. So uh, according to Neoplatonists of the time, the birth of Venus was um, a symbol allegorically of the birth of beauty in the human mind. So this was a way to say here is physical beauty uh, that we're looking at in this female form and that is something that helps us to understand beauty. And of course, Neoplatonists, it would be looking at that earthly beauty was something that would help you to understand divine beauty, right? And that's how the book kind of explains Neoplatonism. Remember the way that we talk about it in class, we just get a few more details. We know that the Neoplatonists are looking back to the ancient Greeks, that they felt like math and beauty were interconnected, right? That visual beauty was created by mathematical ratios like the golden mean. Uh, and when they considered math to be a metaphysical truth. So we have to understand that for classical ancients, beauty was something that was truthful. And that's what the Neoplatonists are going to kind of revive in the Italian Renaissance, right? All of this idealization, all this use of math, all this emphasis on the ideal and the beautiful these were ways to help people understand, um, to understand truth in a greater, to a greater extent. And when you understand truth to a greater extent, then for the Neoplatonists, because they're good Christians, they say you can also understand God to a greater extent. And that's how they kind of build on that classical philosophy. So the text here is a text by Poliziano. It's a poem. Um, it was a Neoplatonic text with a lot of humanist kinds of overtones. Um, there's a lot of references also to another author of the time, uh, Ficino, and some even classical texts are referred to, uh, those of Hesiod, for instance. Um, but throughout, we're just seeing some connections in with Neoplatonism. Now, one of the things with Botticelli is, is a little bit different when it comes to Neoplatonism is his emphasis on math or rather we should probably say his lack of emphasis on math. So you can see that, yeah, there's perspective here and it's accurate, but we don't really get that sense of recession into a mid ground because all the action is so um, concentrated in the foreground. And when we look at the bodies, we can definitely see that he's not regular, rigorously applying those mathematical ratios to the human body. Um, overall, Botticelli um, is not one to emphasize correct anatomy uh, to a great level and instead he is one who tries to kind of manipulate the human form to create a more ideal version of that. So he's not the best example of the Neoplatonic emphasis on math but he is a really good example of the Neoplatonic emphasis on beauty. When we look here at Venus uh, and remember, this is the first full-sized female nude since the time of classical antiquity. 
you can see that she's heavily idealized, right? She's got this S curving pose. She's a little bit elongated, um, but she's very, very lovely. And all of that emphasis on the ideal is a Neoplatonic attempt to bring you closer to understanding truth and to understanding God. When we look at the close-up of her face, you can see that she really is lovely. She really is ideal, really is very beautiful. When we look at our, our next example for the early Renaissance, it really is a step away from Botticelli because if you remember what we looked at with the birth of Venus, Botticelli was still doing some old fashioned kinds of techniques. He had a lot of uh, emphasis on gold, and part of that was due to the content of the poem because gold was linked in with Aphrodite. But that gold was something that was old fashioned. That was something that was popular in the Gothic period. There was a lot of stylization. Um, there was a heavy kind of manipulation of the human form with these S curving poses and the elongation that was uh, not really correct rendering of human anatomy. There are a lot of things there. Uh, and the fact that the figures kind of seemed weightless and that the figures seem kind of uh, linear and hard edged, these are all things that we would associate with that Gothic style, the style that came before the early Italian Renaissance. And we just need to remember that that whole period of the early Italian Renaissance is the old and the new coming, coming together. It's a time of transition. There is a short essay question on the style and the medium of the early Italian Renaissance. So remember to bring out that point that they're putting the old and the new together. They're starting to incorporate some of these new elements, but they don't get rid of those old fashioned elements uh, overnight. When we look here though, we can see that Perugino, and he's actually the teacher of Raphael, that we'll talk about also in the High Renaissance. He is leaving behind quite a bit more of the old fashioned elements and is more fully embracing the new Renaissance classicism. So when we look here just at the style, we can see a couple of things that are a little bit old fashioned. Okay? There is still a sense of elegance and some of that elegance is at the sacrifice of naturalism and that would be old fashioned. Uh, we do still have slight S curves to some of the figures, that's old fashioned. And we also have something called continuous narrative. So we're seeing multiple moments um, of a story being shown at one time. Uh, we have Christ handing the keys of the priesthood to Peter there in the foreground. Uh, but then we also have in the midground some stories shown from the New Testament. So we have the tribute money on the left and on the right we have the stoning of Christ. So Christ is shown in multiple locations uh, in this work. That's continuous narrative and that's old-fashioned. But overall we see a lot of things here that are reflecting that new Renaissance classicism. The bodies, let's talk about those. The proportions are very accurate, they're mathematical, and not only are the bodies in proportion and the poses for the most part are fairly believable, we have a really convincing sense of modeling and chiaroscuro, so everything seems very three-dimensional. And not only uh, do the body seem very three-dimensional, but space here is very convincing. So Perugino is wonderful at showing that linear perspective, that mathematical perspective that creates that sense of recession into space. So that's very convincing as well. To return back to the bodies, we also have some humanism shown here, not only in the accuracy of the bodies, uh, and even though none of them are shown in the nude, right? We do have some individualization on the faces. We also have a sense of human emotion, and we even have some contemporary portraits, and we'll talk about those in a minute. So that's all reflective of that new Renaissance emphasis on humanism. We have classical elements. Remember that they like to incorporate those classical stories or classical elements in uh, in the early Renaissance, they like to combine those classical elements in with Christian content. And that's definitely what's happening here. The classical and the Christian brought together. So what kinds of classical elements do we have? We have a classical sense of believability and bodies and space. So all of that realism is very classical. But in addition to that, we have classical dress. We even have classical architecture in the back. We'll talk about this in a moment, but you can see these two structures that are built upon, or rather modeled upon the Arch of Constantine, a work from classical antiquity. So those elements of classicism coming in, that is something that we have. 
in the early Italian Renaissance as well. Okay, this is a fresco. It's actually in the Sistine ceiling. And remember, tempera and fresco were the most common mediums of the early Italian Renaissance. Uh, and the other thing that we probably need to talk about in terms of how this reflects early Italian Renaissance style would be to talk about the sense of composition here. So we do have a sense of very balanced and harmonious and symmetrical composition. It's restrained, it's logical. It's not necessarily the triangular composition that's really dominant in the early Renaissance. It's actually moving more closely towards that pyramidal composition, right? You got this big kind of temple in the center and the way that it kind of reaches out to this group in the foreground and, and encompasses a sense of space and projection. That's really close to a pyramidal composition. And that's something that we normally associate with the high Renaissance rather than the early Renaissance. You have lots of use of the golden mean. That is definitely something in the early Renaissance as well. And the last thing that we want to kind of remember that the early Renaissance was all about is Neoplatonism. So we already talked about humanism, but we also have Neoplatonism going here. And we all remember when we see math, when we see beauty and idealization, that's Neoplatonism's way of putting truth into the paintings. And when we see those truths, we have a better understanding of God. Okay, those are the ideas. So we talked about a number of ways that math is already shown in the work. We talked about a number of ways uh, the beauty is also shown, right, because we have these idealized kinds of figures. So this is all Neoplatonic in its approach. So when we look at this detail, you can see the humanism going on in the work. You can see how these are individualized figures with differing postures and costumes and expressions and emotions. Uh, but we also have actual portraits. Right? And those use, that use of portraits is something that's very humanistic. Remember, in Italian society, the cult of deeds and the cult of fame was really important. They wanted to celebrate people for their contributions. They wanted to memorialize people um, and remember their reputations. So we can see those portraits going on here with the contemporary figures mixed in with these biblical figures as Peter receives the, the keys of the priesthood. The guy with kind of um, crazy hair, for lack of a better term. I'm trying to think of how to describe this to you where I don't have my laser pointer. Um, the figure that's got his back toward us in the red that's faced away with the halo. To the right of that figure and behind him, there's a, a man in a darker kind of dark blue or black uh, costume looking out towards us. He's got a double chin. That is Perugino himself. Okay, so he's mixed himself in with some of these other contemporary portraits that are placed in. And essentially, this is great PR for all of these contemporary figures that have been shown alongside wonderful figures from the Bible, right? Admirable figures from the Bible. So very humanistic kind of equation of these contemporary figures in with the biblical figures of the past. When we look at this detail of Christ handing the key to St. Peter, you can see how lovely and ideal some of these figures are. Uh, you can see that sense of elegance. And remember, elegance is something that is, is technically old-fashioned, but what Perugino is doing here is he's not sacrificing realism for the sake of elegance, like Botticelli did. And so he's kind of looking forward to the elegance that will be a part of the high Renaissance, where it is incredibly still believable um, at the same time as being very graceful. So the commissioner for this was Pope Sixtus. He was all about um, using art to make the Catholic Church look suitably grand. Uh, and Sixtus himself likes to be tied to Constantine uh, and to St. Peter. And St. Peter was tied to Constantine because Constantine was the patron for old St. Peter. So there was this kind of connection in the contemporary minds between St. Peter and Constantine. So Sixtus wants to associate himself back with those same figures. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we have Peter here shown in the foreground, and he is the first Catholic Pope, right, in Catholic, um, Catholic belief. We have the allusions to Constantine in the back, and really this is just all good PR for Pope Sixtus. Uh, we have to understand that the popes at this point in time were not just religious leaders, but they were also the leaders of the papal states, like the presidents or the kings, I guess is probably a better term, of the papal state. So here Sixtus is saying, I get my you know religious power from Peter. I get my political power from 
Constantine or not necessarily that he gets his power from Constantine, but he's connecting himself back with some of those great Christian rulers of the ancient world as a way to say he's just as successful, he's just as powerful. So you can see the actual Arch of Constantine on the right that still stands in Rome today. You can see the remnants of the Colosseum to the right of that right behind it. Uh, and then you see the Arch of Constantine uh, as it's shown in this fresco. Here in the back, uh, this structure is based on the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. Uh, at this point in the time, at this point in time, they thought that the Dome of the Rock was the Temple of Solomon. So again, kind of further connections back with religious figures of the past who had both political power and religious power as a way for Sixtus to emphasize his own reputation. Now, this is Gian Giovanni Bellini and his St. Francis in the Desert. He is a Venetian artist, and they're doing quite a bit of things different in Venice versus how things are going in the rest of Italy, and we don't have time to get into all of that. I do just want you to realize that in Venice, the artists are more exposed to things that are happening in the northern parts of Europe, and they are more aware of the oil painting that is dominant in northern European Renaissance style and the amount of detail that those artists incorporate because of the oil painting. And so we started to see that Bellini is, in, is doing some of those same kinds of things. And that's very different from what artists were doing in Florence and Rome. They were usually more gen uh, generalized rather than so detailed, not so much emphasis on textures and really luminous colors. But Bellini is kind of combining some of those Northern elements in with what's happening in the Southern parts of Italy. If you look at this detail here, you can see all of the realism that's inherent in showing these different kinds of plants and trying to show them in believable amounts of minute detail. Here's a detail even further. Right? You can see all of the details in the plant life, the, the detail of the stigmata of St. Francis in his hand. Okay, so that finishes us up for the early Renaissance and gets us ready to talk about the high Renaissance.